the concept here is that you really just need to be one day ahead of your your audience because as long as you are one day ahead one chapter ahead one book ahead of your audience you're going to be able to provide them value because they are not there yet welcome to multifamily insights i'm your host john kasman i want to thank you for joining us for another great episode Listen, if you love this show, if you're getting good feedback, getting great ideas, make sure you leave us that rating and review. It helps us reach more people, but also get that feedback so we can make the show work harder for your investing goals. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Now, today we've got a great one. We're going to be talking to Drew Donaldson. Drew Donaldson is a serial entrepreneur, growth strategist, and founder of Grow House, a marketing strategy and execution firm serving SMBs across the country. After over a decade of serving corporate America as a marketing consultant, Drew founded Grow House in January 2020 on the eve of a global pandemic. Today, just three years later, Grow House has helped hundreds of clients grow to and through their first six and seven figures. Let's welcome to the show, Drew Donaldson. John, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Hey, Drew, uh, I went over your bio at a very high level. Why don't you take two minutes to fill in some of those gaps? So like you said, uh, I spent most of my early career in corporate America. I became a marketing consultant almost right out of college. Um, I just happened to go to film school and graduate at the time when most businesses were just getting onto YouTube for the first time. And so a lot of businesses didn't know how to, A, produce video content, uh, homebrew it, you know, create it themselves. Uh, they didn't know how much they should spend on it. They didn't know even what should be in the content. And so I was kind of at, at the perfect spot because I had just spent four years in film school producing stuff for beer money. Um, and so, you know, when you're dealing with, you know, a nickel and dime budget and you're coming to a, 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 a small business and you say, yeah, I know that last guy just said that he could do this for like $15,000. I think I could do it for like 500. You make a lot of friends, <laughs> like a lot of people want to want to be your client. And so I built up a reputation of really kind of knowing my stuff and knowing how to create this content really af affordably. And throughout that process, uh, the next obvious question is, okay, now great, we have this great video, what do we do with it? And so that's really where the more consulting started coming in, because I would have these long phone calls with clients where I'm like, well, you could do this, you could do that, you could run this kind of campaign. And at one point, a client came to me and said, you should probably be charging me for this. And I was like, yeah, I I guess that kind of makes sense. I should probably should. Like, I've been on the phone for like an hour with you telling you all this stuff. And uh, so that really kind of shifted my perspective. And uh, so after doing that for a number of years and working in the studio system a bit, uh, I got recruited to a nonprofit. I helped them build a video department and insource all of their ad agency work. So again, just like helping them save money. I think they saved $325,000 the first year we were working together just by insourcing all that. And for a nonprofit, that's a lot of money. And then uh, I moved into uh, pharmaceuticals for a bit, biotech for a bit, doing very similar things, teaching people how to produce content really, really affordably. And then my, uh, my last big consultancy was at Institutional Asset Management, um, running a, a, essentially a content farm uh, for their clients. And so we had a $3.4 million book of business that we were producing client for with all of the biggest names in asset management that like, just pick one out of the dark. I, I'm I'm sure I've probably worked with them in some capacity, whether it was a white paper, a webinar or whatnot. And so throughout all that time, um, I really loved marketing, but I did not like corporate America. I did not like the corporate culture. Um, and I really wanted to be in, in small business because that's my whole family's in small business. My family are farmers and small business owners. And those are the people I grew up with. Those are the people I really like being around. And so over all my time in, in corporate America, the, the main focus was like, how do I do this at a smaller scale? And uh, 2020 gave me that opportunity because even though I wanted to launch the business, I had a consulting agreement ending at the end of the year. And uh, I wanted to launch this business uh, to, to kind of make that transition smoother. The pandemic kind of threw everything into a, a tailspin for me. And instead of selling, I just spent the entire year talking to small business owners. And I really figured out what was wrong with how small business owners were being approached by marketing agencies and where the gap was in the service. And so that's what we did to, that's that's how Grow House came to be, is we essentially build the gap. Uh, you know, you have these, you have DIY marketing on one side of the valley, and you have really, really expensive agencies at the other side. And there was no one serving that middle portion of people who 
are sophisticated enough where they don't, they know they can't do everything themselves, but they're not at a point where they can go and spend 10, 20, $30,000 a month on a marketing agency. And so we fit really comfortably in that gap and we've been doing it successfully for three years for hundreds of clients. It's been fantastic. I love it, man. Listen, just to recap that for those who are listening, you know, uh, one, you say coming out of you know college, you were in film school and uh, you took that, that knowledge, that expertise and almost immediately kind of made that a marketing consultant role because you're talking to people, you're realizing you can do this with beer money, basically. They were being charged $15,000. So you're able to make a lot of friends and get a lot of exposure and work on a lot of different projects based on that. From there, you work with different organizations, work for different companies, but eventually you realize that your heart was actually working with small business owners. That's kind of the way you grew up, the people you were closest to, and you wanted to help more small business owners kind of fill the gap as you called it, right? You know, not necessarily those big companies that have the budgets to spend $15,000 a month on a marketing agency, but something a little bit beyond that do it yourself, right? That person is just going to take their content, shoot something on their own phone, post it themselves. Someone who's actually needs help is looking to outsource that help, but has a sense of what they are hoping to accomplish with this work here. So you said something that stood out to me. You talked about um, really you had a passion for teaching people how to make content more efficiently. And just talk about that process, right? Because I think for a lot of people, we all know we should be making more content, right? Like if you follow Gary Vee or any of these kind of people, they'll tell you, you know, you should be shooting videos every day. You should be just posting your life. You should build in public. There's a whole lot of that kind of messaging. Even when you hear that, even someone like me who does a podcast, you know, I shoot a bunch mm -hmm. of stuff. It's still, I don't call it hard, but it's still sometimes it's tough to sit down, create the content, understand exactly what you want to say, why you want to say it, what you're hoping to get out of it. So talk to us about some of the challenges that these clients of yours face when it comes to creating content and particularly with figuring out what to say. So the what to say question is actually probably like the third in my list of like challenges people run into. The number one challenge is whether or not you're a natural content creator. And that is very much, it's just like being a D1 football player. Either you got it or you don't. There is no middle ground there. There's no gray area. Either you are comfortable picking up your phone and just talking into it and then sitting and editing it and making it look great. And you enjoy that process. And that's, that's rewarding to you and you want to do it. Or you're like me and you hate all of it. Right. I, I came from the world of content and I hate content marketing. Right. And I hate it because I have the same problems as everybody else. Right. I want it to look great. I want it to be perfect. I want to script all my stuff out. But I also have clients I need to take care of. I can't go and just dedicate six hours of my time to shooting a video one day because that's six hours that I'm not spending making revenue. Right. So, like, that's the first thing is like, if you are a natural content creator, this is not going to be for you because you already figured this out. You already figured out how to come up with ideas for content. You already figured out how to edit stuff. You already figured out, um, you know, how to look good on camera and all that. For those of you who are like me and who hate doing this stuff, the thing you need to accept is that the only way to scale content marketing is not to just get over yourself and do the Gary Vee thing and do six. No. Love Gary Vee. I think he's really brilliant. I think his advice on 65 pieces of content is absolutely insane. And it really shows how kind of separated he has become from true small businesses and what it's like to run a true small business. That's not saying that's just what happens when you get to be as big as Gary Vee and you have a team of people following you around editing all your content, 65 pieces of content's like nothing. And if you're 21 years old, and you have no responsibilities, and you're working part time, 65 pieces of content, no big deal. But if you're like most of us who work 40, 50, 60 hours a week, making actual revenue, where are we going to find that time? And so the first thing you need to accept is that you're going to need help, you're going to need a video editor that and someone that is going to be on your team all the time, like you just need to pony up the money to pay a video editor at least part-time throughout the week. Now, that's not to say you have to have an on-site person or even someone in this country. There are amazing video editors in the Philippines and in India and in Kenya that you can go and hire for pennies on the dollar because of the exchange rate. You know, for example, someone in the Philippines making $8 an hour is making almost what like a doctor in the Philippines would make, right? Like th there's a huge benefit there to both sides of that equation. 
we get the the labor we need to get these projects done and on the other hand they're making a, a truly middle class income that they would not be able to make with companies in their own backyard and so it sol solves both of the problems there and you really don't give up the kind of uh you know back when i was in college they always said you can't outsource creativity it's not true it's like there are plenty of creative people all around the world the united states does not have a, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, the only talent pool in the world. And uh, because of that, it just, that's the first thing you have to kind of accept is that you're going to need help. You're going to need to find a person to do this. And then once you have that person, part of that role should be researching what videos you should do. And the research process is really simple. There's a bunch of websites you can go out, answer the public, qna.db.io or something like that. There's a uh, SEMrush buzz, uh, what's the other one, buzzsaw or something like that. I forget. There's a whole list of them. They're all on my website. If uh, you want to link to it, I have a whole resource center with all that kind of stuff. But you go in there and you just type in your industry and it gives you a bunch of questions that real people are asking. And that's your video content right there. You just look at which ones have the highest amount of search. You could also do this with Google Keyword Planner. Just go in and see what people are searching in your industry. And that gives you your content. The other thing to do is just go onto YouTube and type in your business and see what the things that are popping up recently, right? Sort by recent, see what other creators are talking about. That'll give you a pretty good idea of what's interesting and what people are engaging with in your content. Once you have that, then you just need to either figure out that you're good enough to ad lib this stuff, right? Where you can just turn on the camera, shoot some footage, send it to your editor. They can make it look great and off you go. Or you need to get, start thinking about scripting these. Again, probably don't have time to do this. That's where ChatGPT comes in. ChatGPT is the greatest small business invention ever. Like we now can type in, I need a video script that talks about X, Y, and Z for you know the Texas real estate market. Boom, you have a script in five seconds. Load that into something like Prompt Smart or Big View, uh, which is teleprompter software, read it off. So it's, I, I think that's the big process is like, you just have to accept if you're not one of these naturally talented people, you're going to need help. You're going to need to leverage some of these new tools. And once you do leverage it, it becomes a lot easier. And then you don't really have to think about it so much because you're like, well, I have my system. My Monday morning system is I go into chat GPT or I go to YouTube. I do a little searching. I find a topic. I punch the topic into chat GPT. It pops out a script. I record the script, send it to my editor by Tuesday, the video is done. You could do that every morning. You could do that every morning while you're drinking your cup of coffee. Drew, you know? the, thing I, the thing I like about what you just said there is that you talked about um, really creating, creating a system. And yeah. anyone who's trying to launch a business, trying to scale a business, we understand how important systems and processes are. So when you take it from being inspired and just being creative, like, oh, I've got this great idea for a video. Let me go shoot this, right? I think that's the way a lot of people think about content creation is – I'm going to be inspired when I'm inspired. I'm going to create something when it's great. But if I don't have something that is that good or I'm not inspired or I don't think we're going to take off, well, I'm not going to do it, right? Because we don't want to produce subpar content. And what you're talking about is creating a system that really takes out some of that guesswork. One, figuring out what kind of content you want to create. But I think the most important thing is what you said, getting an editor, getting some outside people to help because they're also going to help you be accountable. Right. It's helpful yeah. to have someone else who is expecting you to give them that content that you said you were going to give them. And if you're paying these people, well, guess what? You got to figure out a way to make this thing work. So I think that's really helpful. Can we go back to where you started? Because you said there were two, there were three uh, challenges that people face. Right. One was uh, basically not being a natural. Number three was what we talked about, which was, you know, what to come up with. What was the second challenge that you think, uh, you know, people come up with there? I think that really kind of factors in more to the time commitment. And I think you time summarize yeah. it really perfectly, which is it's, it's a system. Like you have to stop thinking, even though content creation is creative, it's not creative for everybody. Some people just need to get it done, right? Yep. Some people just need to, to get something out there so that they're present so that people are seeing it. It doesn't mean that the content can be boring. It doesn't mean like one of the worst pieces of advice uh, I've ever heard Gary Vee, and I don't mean to attack Gary Vee. I really do like the guy. I like, I, I, I'm, I, you know, I grew up with him. Um, so I, I'm not attacking his philosophy. What I'm saying is that he gave a speech a while ago that said, just record anything, just record anything and put it up there. And he did this at a keynote. And afterwards, 
my feed on like YouTube and Facebook was just filled with these people being like, well, Gary V just said to post something. So uh, I'm getting a bagel. And he's like, I get what he was trying to go for, but telling people to just post anything, it's kind of like telling people, well, just go to the gym, just go to the gym without having a plan of what to do there. Like, have yeah. you ever seen one of the, I don't know if you go to the gym or not, but you've ever seen I one understand. of those people that's like, it's, you can tell it's their first day and they're like, they're walking around looking at everything. And you're like, ah, that's a new guy, right? He's not really sure what to do. He's not sure if he wants to do cardio first. He wants to do some strength training or hit the heavy bat. Like he's just trying to feel it out. That's kind of what Gary Vee wants you to do. He wants you to just get into the game and then hopefully things will just kind of work themselves out. That works if you're going to be a natural content creator. If you're not, it's gonna, you're going to walk around the gym for an hour and then leave <laughs> like because you're just going to be overwhelmed and be like, I don't really like this. I don't I need some structure. And that's what a system like this does is it just gives yeah. you that clear runway. And Drew, I think what's in, there's an important distinction there between, I think, maybe those two philosophies, because I like to use a different analogy as well when it comes to, like, again, people investing in multifamily or maybe raising capital, whatever it is. And there is this notion of you have to start by taking action. And I think that's the takeaway. And what I, what Gary, I didn't hear exactly, but I think what his yeah. intent was, you have to start by taking action. You can't start by just analyzing every single thing because you won't yeah. take action. So just like going to the gym, just like starting to create videos, you have to take action. The key is you have to get the feedback and you have to look for ways to optimize what you're doing. If you just go to the gym and you never have a game plan and you just spend, you know, five minutes on this machine and five minutes on this machine and, you know, you're just on your phone half the time, you're not going to get results, right? But if you're going to the gym and you're doing stuff, now you can start to tweak it and say, you know what? I'm watching what this guy over here is doing. He's doing these machines and he's working up. Okay, he's doing upper body today. He's doing this, he's doing that, he's doing this. Let me follow that. Now I can get a workout routine. I can follow that. Maybe I can get a trainer. That will help you. And I think what you're talking about is get that trainer, right? Get the plan. Don't just do anything. Yes, show up, but show up with a plan. And that will help you feel more comfortable because if you are that person at the gym and you don't have a plan, well, it's going to, you're not going to feel comfortable if you don't have a plan. And that is more than likely going to make you not come back because you're going to feel like either you're embarrassed, you wasted your time. You just, you know, you won't feel good about that experience. And it's the same thing. If you just start randomly shooting any piece of content without any plan, well, it's probably not going to do very well. And you're probably not going to get the results you were hoping to get. So what you're talking about, Drew, is show up. Yes, but show up with the plan. Show up with some people who can help you with a, a pathway to see success so that you feel good about it. And yes, you know, you're putting in the work, but hopefully you can start to see some returns or at least start to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish so that you can get better and better and better as opposed to just flailing, you know, hopelessly and, and just hoping that this thing works out. What, what are your thoughts on that? And you're, you're hundred percent right. I mean, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, the, the reality is, is that the, when you get that feedback, that's why people become addicted to creating content. And that's why you see people get in trouble uh, where they they chase the envelope a little too far, right? Like, you know, there there's that uh, girl that got canceled recently because she wrapped her kid up in saran wrap. And like, I don't know if you saw that. It was a whole I big scandal. That. That's... Yeah, not good. <laughs> not a good look. She was chasing some clout. She was addicted yeah. to the views. She wanted to put out content. She thought, oh, this is really, this would be really funny. Um, and she put the video out and it, it tanked her career, right? She, I think she lost endorsement deals and all sorts of stuff because she, of this one bad thing. So it is a very addictive thing to start getting that feedback. And that's why the hardest video you will ever shoot is your first one. Every other video you shoot will be easier. So it's, a, it's very, very similar to public speaking. Like if you ever, you know, get invited to, to speak on stage somewhere, that first lecture you give. The first time I ever did public speaking was when I was 18 years old at my graduation. I had to give a speech and I was petrified. I practiced this thing like two hours a day for six weeks. And I was, I was nervous and shaky and my voice was warbly and, and all of that stuff. Now I do public speaking all the time and it doesn't, doesn't bother me at all. That first video you shoot, nothing will make you more nervous than that first video. And then the second video, you'll still be nervous, but you'll be a little bit better. And the third video, you'll be a little bit better. Fourth video, it's just like riding a bike. You gain that confidence and then it becomes much, much easier. And because you're using a system, it's. It, I think the gym analogy works really well 
because if once you are on a system, you see those results, you see that I take this input and I get this output. And even if uh, last week's video didn't do too good, it doesn't matter, right? Because there's another Monday's right around the corner and you can create the next piece of content. And so I think that's the, the, the biggest thing is, yeah, you got to show up with a plan. You got to, you got to, at a bare minimum, understand after I, you know, I'm going to sit, how am I going to create the piece of content? How am I going to shoot the content? How am I going to edit it? How am I going to post it? You need to solve for those questions. And then that gives you your plan. Yeah, I, I love that part, right? Because that's really breaking it down, right? What is the piece of content you're creating? How do you actually create it? How do you edit it? How do you get this thing live? And then what we haven't talked about is how do you promote it, right? How do you make sure that people actually see this content? So that's the other thing that you need to solve. But let's start with that person trying to, you know, starting out, right? Maybe they haven't yep. done content before. They've heard people talk about, okay, you got to build a brand. You got to create content. Mm -hmm. You got to put yourself out there. But they're not that D1 person you mentioned, right? They're not the natural. Yep. This is not their passion. They have no, really no desire to do this but maybe it's a necessary evil. So for that individual where it's easier just to avoid this and to say, mm -hmm. nope, I'll leave that for John and Drew. You mentioned that you're not a natural. Um, people may or may not believe me, but I'm not a natural. This is not something I enjoy. Like you, I spent 15 years in marketing. I'm comfortable behind the scenes. Man, I, I think my first podcast episode, I wrote out literally every single question I was going to ask. I had it all right there on my screen. I refused to do video for at least 120 episodes because I just, you know, didn't like the way, you know, the, the cameras would show up and where I would be. And But we have to get over this, right? It takes time mm -hmm. to, to get comfortable and get into that. So for that person who mm -hmm. doesn't feel comfortable with this, they're not a natural, but they do see the benefits and understand how this could benefit them. What would you say to them to help them maybe get over that fear? And not even fear, but just get over maybe that hesitation so that they can move forward and grow their business. So I think two things. I think the first thing, if, if you're worried about how you look on camera, like, let's face it, not everyone is born with the body of an Adonis. And, you know, I was telling you before we started about my client commenting on my hairline, which, by the way, has not changed in 18 years. Like, it is the same hairline I've always had. But, uh, you know, that those kind of things can really drive insecurity uh, if you're if you're not confident about the way you look when it comes to that, um, that's I, I'm not a psychologist. I can't, you know, psychoanalyze some, especially not blind, tell you, oh, well, this is how you should feel about it, or this is how you can approach that. What I would instead tell you is your face doesn't have to be on camera. What else could you show? Are you a good drawer? Are you good at like drawing stuff out? What if you did whiteboard videos, get an overhead rig and a giant whiteboard and sketch out what you're talking about? Maybe uh, you like, walk, you know, walking in the woods, right? Center mount your or hold your phone with the camera facing the other way and call it, you know, walk in the woods with Walter. And, you know, well, you know, Walter is going to give you all the investing advice you need or, or whatever your, your topic is for that video. So you don't have to show your face. Does it help? Does it build trust? Does it build rapport? Yes, it does. Because as humans, we're naturally tribal. We naturally want to be with other people. Even, you know, people who are, you know, introverts still feel like they want some kind of human connection. A lot of times that's why introverts prefer doing stuff, doing stuff on social rather than doing stuff in person. And so I think that's the, the first thing to kind of understand is like, you don't have to, you don't have have to put yourself in there. I think the other part it, beyond just getting better at it and, and shaking off the dust and, and all of that kind of stuff is the, the content that you produce, the, the quality of the content you produce is going to vary. It's going to be really bad when you start. And as you go, it's going to be get, get better. So naturally, you're probably not going to get a lot of hits or you're not, you're going to get some nasty comments, maybe even on those first videos. The best thing I've, I, and I tell all of my clients this who are nervous about it is I want you to treat your TikTok account or your YouTube account or any of those accounts like a 401k. I want you to post and not look at it. Delete the app, download the app, post, delete the app, right? Just because putting that content out there is beneficial. It will build your tolerance to that. And if that's what bugs you about it is going and obsessively checking, just take the take that away. Or better yet, I've actually had one client do this. She was so anxiety ridden because of this issue. She could not stop looking at her numbers. 
we changed the password to the accounts and gave them to her assistant and said, do not let her in the account. Post all the videos for her. Don't, because she was great. She Her videos did great. People loved her, but she was obsessive. Like she would get one bad comment and it would ruin her whole day. And this is a very successful woman who has nothing to fear, has a great business, like no reason whatsoever. So we went to her, we changed the, the passwords, we gave it to her assistant. We were just like, you're not to let her in. And she called me a couple of weeks, like she, she was upset at first. She's like, I don't like that. I, I I like to be able to see, you know, what people are are interacting and all of that. And I think she still was like able to sneak in and look at comments every once in a while. But taking the logins away and out of her hands and making her not able to go in and, and comment back and, and have that kind of paralysis uh, really went a long way. Like we did that for probably six weeks and then she kind of got over it and she was like, okay, it's okay. I can get back on. And then she never, didn't really have that anxiety anymore because you just have to accept that you're not going to be perfect from the get-go. But once you start putting out content, you'll find your audience, you'll find your tribe. And then when people go and say, you know, oh, nice hairline or boy, you should hit the gym or whatever nasty thing that you're, you're self-conscious about, it'll roll off your back. You don't even care about it anymore. It's like one guy who cares. You know, and Drew, I, I think to your point, what you're getting at here is like, again, belonging to that tribe. And anytime you're trying something new or trying something different, you're vulnerable, right? Just yeah. like that person going to that new gym for the first time, right? You're, if you don't know what you're doing, maybe your confidence isn't there. You think people are looking at you and, and maybe they are, right? Maybe they are. Mm -hmm. And the more you do it, the more you're going to fit in, the more it will feel natural and the easier it becomes. And that's just one of those things when it comes to creating content and figuring out who you're creating that content for. Um, for, for some people, may, they may not feel like they're the experts. You know, maybe you're mm -hmm. watching these YouTube videos or these Facebook or whatever it is, and you see these people who are amazing. You know, they've got bigger portfolios, they've got bigger businesses, they've got huge followings, and maybe you don't have that natural ability to speak or to have that charisma, whatever it is. And maybe that's the challenge that you face. Talk to us a little bit about that imposter syndrome and how to maybe overcome that so that you can kind of take advantage of some of the content creation uh, benefits there. So what I always tell my clients who are in that situation is the the one day principle. And the the concept here is that you really just need to be one day ahead of your, your audience. That's it. Just one day, right? Because as long as you are one day ahead, one chapter ahead, one book ahead, of your audience, you're going to be able to provide them value because they are not there yet. Now, let's look at someone who's like wildly successful, Warren Buffett, right? Top, top of the, the investing kingdom. Yeah, if you're just getting started in multifamily, and you have, you know, two or three units so far under your belt, and you're, you're, you know, looking for that, that next big bump or that next big deal uh, to, to get more, uh, to get a larger portfolio. Yeah, you're not going to, you're not going to really produce anything that's going to impress Warren Buffett. But that's okay because Warren Buffett isn't your audience, right? Your audience might be the dentist who's never touched real estate before, who still rents or lives in his mom's basement for some reason. Like, who knows? But there are always going to be people that are a day behind you. And as long as you keep a day ahead of them, you're never at, li at risk of losing them. And if one point, if that person becomes so good at what you do that they surpass you, well, that's okay, because there's a line of people that are still one day behind you. The only way that has a negative long term effect is when you are too stuck in your ways to adapt to a changing market, right? Think about, you know, I think we're both probably around the same age. Think about the people who refuse to get computers, who refuse to get cell phones, who refuse to get, who refuse to update and get a Facebook page for their business. How well are their businesses doing now? Not well, right? Like if you ignore what's going on outside of you, that is a, a keystone of failure right there. But if you are constantly growing as a person, you're reading books, you're gaining information, you're learning new things, you're studying from people who are a day above you, which there are plenty of people that are a day beyond me, right? Russell Brunson is an amazing marketer. He is, he's not a day ahead of me. He's years ahead of me right? And that's why an hour of his time costs $100,000. Because he has plenty of people who are even beyond me, but still not at his level yet, who will gladly pay him $100,000. And I'll tell you what, if I get to their level one day, and I can afford a $100,000 meet and greet with Russell, I'm gonna take it. 
because picking his brain for an hour is going to net unbelievable results, right? You're going to be able to learn so much more. And that's what you have to remember. These people that are behind you in line, they're looking at you like you've got the secret. You've made it, man. You've got three units. I have no units. Like that's, I, I think that's the other part is you have to be like, you have to understand that success is not an, an, a zero sum game. Like success comes in stages. And so you're successful right now with three units. Doesn't mean yeah. that the guy down the street with six units is more successful than you. It just means he's farther along in his journey, right? The only way to really calculate this is the day you die. The day you die, then all the cards are on the table. It's like, all right, let's 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 see how uh, how good he really was. And at which point you shouldn't care because you're dead. So it's there's <laughs> at no point should you be worrying about where other people are on the, on the field. Uh, you really should just, focus on your own journey, focus on the people that you can help. And don't worry about the people you can't. I, I really like that advice, right? One day ahead, you can help the person as long as you're one day ahead, because you're going to be able to show them maybe what's ahead and what's next. And the thing that's really cool, too, is it's attainable for many people. And said differently, you know, someone like Warren Buffett giving you investing advice, you may not even be in, even if you gave you the best advice, you may not be in a position to actually implement that advice because it's not where you're at on your journey, right? It's like, oh, I would take oh, yeah. $10 million and invest in this. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't, we don't have that part of the equation here, right? There's this, yeah. uh, this joke on Twitter about would you rather have like a million dollars or I think $500 or something like that or dinner with Jay-Z. And a lot of people are like, oh, dinner with Jay-Z because, you know, oh, I'm going to learn so much. That it's, it's like, maybe not, because the stuff he's going to tell you is for stuff in the people who are, again, just a couple steps below where he is. You know, he can give you that nugget that's going to be huge. Same with Russell Brunson and same with other investors versus that person. If you have zero units, that person who has three units is probably very valuable to you because it's very practical with the advice or the information they're going to provide versus that person who syndicated, you know, a thousand units, myself in that range too. I have to go back to who I was then to give you very practical advice. I tell you what I'm doing now, it probably won't help you as much. Right. So I think that part of it is, is really important. If you're thinking about this imposter syndrome is don't worry about it. Start your journey with where you're at. You are who you are. Share that journey because you will find people who get value out of that. Um, the other thing I'll say too, is when I first launched this podcast, one of the hesitations I had was I didn't think the world needed another podcast. We are on episode 500 or so plus now. And mm -hmm. back then, I felt like there were a lot of real estate podcasts. And what happened, I had a conversation with another podcaster and I had met him at a conference and I was like, oh, I know you're listening to your show. It's awesome. And he later on, we were talking and um, what he said to me was, the world may not need another real estate podcast, but the people in your circle do. Your sphere of influence needs to hear from you because representation matters. They want to see and understand who you are. They want to understand what you know about real estate. They want to understand why this is such a passion for you. And that's going to help them grow by seeing someone they know, like, and trust in this space. So if you are hesitant on creating content or sharing more of your journey, Take yourself out of the equation. Who are the people around you that you could help that would be inspired, that would actually take action if they saw what you were doing, if they could learn some of the things that you know? If you can take yourself out of it and see who you can help, that may be the difference in you getting started and helping these people versus going along on your journey by yourself. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, Drew, we talked a lot about kind of some of the clients and people you're helping and some of the challenges people have with content creation. Let's talk about Grow Halls real quick. Who are some of the clients that you're working with right now? What's the range and who's ideal for you to take on to work with? So like I said, we really uh, prefer to stick in that range of people who have kind of exhausted their DIY marketing. They've kind of hit the wall in terms of like, this is what I'm going to be able to accomplish on my own without some kind of guidance. And people who are, you know, at that level where it's like, it's not a matter of figuring out the marketing, I already have a successful product, I need someone to run it for me, right. And so that's really where we play. So a lot of our clients are consultants, coaches, other marketing agencies, we actually have several other marketing agencies who come to us for for help. 
Um, we have uh, people that are in the printing business. We have durable goods. We have appliance repair companies. Um, we've had contractors and landscapers. Um, really, the the type of business doesn't matter. It, it's you know the only we we don't work for vice, right? So we don't do casinos. We don't do strip clubs. We don't do adult entertainment. Uh, that kind of stuff is if they fall under like the vice category, we don't really touch it. CBD is a little gray area. It's something that I do have CBD clients, but it's not something I'm looking to grow. We're still because of the legality issues and the, the difficulty advertising those kind of products. It's one of those things we're kind of we're tiptoeing our, our toes into the water. Um, but really, any any person that is passionate about your business, about their business, that's who I want to work for. So we've worked with real estate syndicators in the past, we've real, worked with real estate brokers in the past, we've worked with financial advisors in the past. Uh, but the thing all of these businesses share is that they love what they do. They're not just in it for the money. They're not just doing it as a get rich quick scheme. Um, I'll have people come through probably once a month or so, we'll see one of my ads, we'll click, we'll book a call. And it is very clear that this is a get rich quick. And those are not people I work with. Um, I won't even entertain the idea because the reality is business is hard. Business is hard and you're going to have bad days. And the only thing that is going to get you through those bad days is heart. And if you don't have that, if you don't have the love for the business, the love for the game, the passion, you're going to quit because it's just not that fun. Like on my worst days, if I didn't love what I did, if I wasn't excited to get on calls like this and calls with my clients, um, I would have left. This is hard. It's hard, like getting a business off the ground. So that's really the people we look for. Generally, you know, we've helped people that are just getting started. Like one of the great stories I tell people is a, uh, a mom who had literally $100 in her bank account when she showed up at my door. And now two years later, after a lot of work on her part and building this thing, uh, she's able to not just pay her, her own bills, but, you know, she had 150% growth January to February this year. Like she is now on a trajectory to outpace what her parents make, what her entire family makes, because she was she put in the work, but she it took her two years because she didn't have a million dollars to just dump into Facebook ads or TikTok ads. She had to be very persistent. She had to work the, the ground game. She had to, you know, not necessarily door knock, door knocking wasn't really her business, but do the digital equivalent of door knocking. And uh, it paid off, but it's going to take time. And that's why I always, uh, you know, kind of come back to and, and this is just two things that I wanted to mention earlier. One, uh, don't be afraid of paid media. Paid media for content marketing is so unbelievably cheap. We're talking pennies, literal pennies per view. So don't be afraid of that. Uh, and the, the other part of it is make sure when you are looking for, for mentors, and I think this is a part where we really excel inside of a grow house, your mentors need to be contemporaries. They don't like, you know, SCORE is a wonderful organization if you are trying to understand business from the perspective of someone who would teach at a college or someone who is going to give you kind of the basics of like how to set up a business, how to set up payroll, things to worry about when you're trademarking, like SCORE and, and organizations like that are full of uh, retired executives that have huge amounts of knowledge. But if you go to any of them, and I have, I used to have score mentors, I've had multiple score mentors, and you say, hey, I want to run a TikTok campaign, they're going to go, that's great, not the person to ask, they'll be they'll be totally transparent and tell you because they've never ran a TikTok campaign. You know, if you're talking to like a, a 70 year old ex Ford executive, who left the business 20 years ago, he's not in the game anymore. So when it comes to a lot of things in business, having, uh, you know, retired executives uh, as mentors or having people who are in the twilight of their career as mentors is great. But when it comes to marketing, especially in our world where things are changing so quickly, you really need a contemporary mentor. You need someone that is, is literally doing it. I run ads for my business and my clients every single day. If you come to me with an ad and you say, is this ad going to work? I'll be able to tell you if it'll work because, and I'll be able to break it down. Here's why. You're not going to find that unless you make sure the mentors you get are are in the same ballpark, right? That they're not just sitting in the bleachers. So that's really, I, I think, the biggest thing. Uh, did that answer the question? It, I think it I does. Went on a I think it's a, <laughs> no, I think it's a great tip, right? First and foremost, you know, you talked about that client who came to you with a hundred dollars and was able to build her business based off of that by putting in some of that groundwork. But then also, when you're looking at partners, you're looking at mentors, you're looking at people who can help you. 
you want to make sure that they are contemporaries, as you call it. And I would just say that they're in the game. And it's the same with multifamily, right? Marketing specifically because it changes so quickly. I mean, social media wasn't even a thing 20, 25 years ago, right? So yeah. that wasn't even a part of marketing. And now it's one of the, I mean, for many businesses, it's the only or the main portion of the marketing budget. So certainly critical there. But even outside of that, you know, for multifamily, I mean, the landscape continues to change and the, the business continues to change and things that worked 10 years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, fundamentally, yes, those things still work, but this is an ever-changing landscape and you want to have someone in your corner who is in it right now with you, understanding how to navigate, pivoting, making changes, and you typically want to do that. So whenever you're looking at mentors, you're looking at coaches, you want to have people in your corner that understand the current landscape of the business who are active and can help you navigate the current situation, the current environment. If you want to learn more about Grow House, you can go to their website, grohaus.org, .org, not .com. Again, growhouse.org, and you can connect with Drew and his team there. Uh, I want to thank you for this portion of the interview, but now we're going to move on to our round of insights. All right, give me a failure or an apparent failure that set you up for later success. Uh, so I think a couple things. Uh, I'll tell you this one. Um, a lot of people, when they launch their first ads, they treat it very much like a lottery ticket. Like, oh, this, this is going to be the one I can feel it, right? And uh, even for marketers, we think that way, right? We put out a camp, like, uh, obviously you want best, best, your best hopes for something. Um, I had uh, been working with this other agency uh, and we had been talking about, you know, advertising for my business and have some ideas that they were using that were kind of successful. And I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. And um, I put together this, ad. I wrote an eight page ebook uh, and uh, actually had it printed, like, oh, wait, it's here. Sorry, I disappeared for a second. But this is it. This is this is the book. Seven reasons why your next DIY marketing book. It actually is really good. It's not a bad. Like I spent three days writing it, and it's uh, you know it's printed and designed and nice and beautiful. And uh, I put out the ad, and I you know set up the targeting and ran it, and I spent about five hundred dollars on it. Nothing. Not a single lead. So well, that didn't work. So I wrote another ad. Hey, this is Drew. I wrote this ebook. Uh, don't download it, please. <laughs> right? Another five hundred dollars. Crickets. And I got so frustrated, and I said, "This gimmicky crap doesn't work. This whole download my free ebook, download get my webinar, it doesn't work. It doesn't work unless your offer is so unbelievably powerful that." You know, in order for me to make some, like I'd have to make some kind of insane, unrealistic, untrue claim to get people to download this, right? Because the pain wasn't strong enough. And that's what I realized was that this is painful, but it's not the pain that my audience had. And so I sat down and I looked at all of the testimonials I ever got. And I looked at all the comments, the nice things people said, and all the, the things people said they didn't like. Like when we were doing exit interviews and they were like, well, I didn't really like this or I was hoping you would do this, or, you know, I was really looking for this. And I took all of that and I wrote an ad that didn't really talk about marketing at all. It talked about how badly marketing had kind of failed small business and how the only options for the small business owner was either do it yourself or buy my $10,000 course and then do it yourself. And that was it. And that's frustrating because you spend all this money on a course, but you're a small business owner, you're busy. So you don't have time to do it. I recorded this thing, it took me 15 takes to record it. I didn't edit it, I didn't put music behind it. I did it in one take, reading off a teleprompter. Shot it right here in my office. Uh, to date, uh, I have 150, uh, 150X return on ad spend for that ad. I book 10 to 15 calls a week from that ad. I spend $1,500 a month uh, on that and uh, it's just been an unbelievable upward trajectory. And the reason it worked was because instead of trying to do the gimmicky stuff, the stuff that all the gurus will tell you to do, the posting 15 times a day on, on TikTok and, and write an ebook and, and do a webinar or VSL, I took it back to the basics. 
I said, well, pe people are in pain. I can help them get out of pain. Let me just talk about their pain. And so I made that video about their pain and people responded. And to date, every person that comes through just about says, you know what the thing that stood out to me, you didn't look like every other marketer on TikTok. You didn't look like every, every other marketer on TikTok. And you didn't sound like it and you didn't make any kind of crazy promise, right? You told me, like I tell three stories in the, in the ad about clients that I've helped. They're not crazy stories, but they're success stories, right? I gave people a little bit of hope and it was enough to get them to book on my calendar. So I think that was the a big turning point for me where I, I shifted my focus from trying to chase marketing trends to chasing pain. And I know that kind of sounds a little ambulance chasery, but the reality is, is marketing is all about just repositioning pain as opportunity. That's all it is. So that's how I, I now approach all of my marketing. Um, so I don't know if, uh, is that, uh, is that a good insight for you? First of all, it's a great answer. Uh, <laughs> I love the detail on there. My mind was actually just, you know, going, you know, I was over here like with an idea for me. I'm like, oh man, you're right. My current Facebook ads are terrible. We need to go back and redo it. So I just yeah. went down my own little personal journey as you were talking, <laughs> but, uh, and then I forgot we were in a round of insights, which is supposed to be a uh, quicker, fast paced question. Oh, I was, was going to ask you like three follow-ups to that. I'm like, wait a minute. No, that's not my time to do that. So I, we'll have to get you back part on another two, time. Part two, part two. Right, yeah. part two. Um, but I love that insight, and I think it's really important. And I, and I will say this. Normally, I do not interject during this phase, but um, there is um, – I forget the guy's name right now, but he's a great copywriter, and he writes a bunch of – um copy and he literally uh, i think he's got a piece of content that says uh copy that converts and he does a course and all this other stuff but one of the things he talked about was you know people you, you when you're creating content you want to help them with um either their 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 pain points um their pain their pleasure their goals and desires um yeah. i'm sorry i'm sorry that's not it it's their fears their frustrations goals and desires so those are the things that whenever you're creating content, you want to address one of those four things. What are their fears? What are their frustrations? What are their goals? What are their desires? If it doesn't attach or, or really address one of those things, then it's not really likely to, to make that emotional connection. So whenever you're connecting with people or trying to connect with people, ask yourself, does this address their fears or frustrations, which obviously you did a great job of doing that. So it's not really ambulance chasing. You're trying to address their frustrations, right? Um, yeah. and, and then also trying to address their goals and desires. So just a quick little tidbit. I will stop interjecting now and move on to our <laughs> next question, which is- I'll try to keep them short. Sorry, you kind of yeah, lined no me worries. up for that one. So. No worries. And you gave a couple good ones earlier, so I took some notes, but uh, give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Uh, high level. High level is the single greatest CRM marketing- High low, you said, planet. or high level? High, high level. Um, high level. It's so powerful. We actually give it away free to all of our clients. We're a high level agency. And so we have, a, you know, kind of an agency level license and we give every single client that signs up, whether they sign up for our lowest package or our highest package, uh, full and complete and free access to the platform because it's, it's a game changer in the world of marketing. Like this is the kind of software that I remember back in my corporate days, we would design stuff that high level can now do. And I would be so frustrated because I was like, this is so cool. Like, man, could you imagine if we could do this for a contractor or for a, a coffee shop? And you could, there's just nothing out there. And uh, high level is, it, you can do it. I mean, it's it's un, it's unreal how powerful it is. And it, uh, it costs 97 bucks a month if you buy it from them directly. Um, and like I said, I just give it away. It's it's too powerful of a tool for us to charge for. I love it, man. All right, give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. That's a good one. Um, the Adweek Copywriting Handbook by Joe Sugarman. This is the guy that wrote the Boom Blockers campaign. It is the best it's the best textbook ever written on copywriting. Um, it draws from all of the great copywriters in the world. Um, and it's the most concise to the point, like it was one of the last copywriting books I read and I felt like it perfectly tied together all of these other great books you hear about. So, you know, just to, to list off a couple, uh, Claude Hopkins Scientific Advertising uh, or Breakthrough Advertising, I think was his. Uh, I get those two. There's Breakthrough Advertising and Scientific Advertising. They're both very good. 
Um, there's uh, uh, the Boron Letters, which is, you know, jailhouse letters written from a marketer to his son. Very weird book, but good book on copywriting. Um, and there's Copywriting Secrets, who's actually written by a friend of Russell Brunson's, who's also, that's a phenomenal book too. Um, and of course, .com and Expert Secrets are, you know, traffic secrets you can skip. There's not really a lot of value there, but the first two books in that series are just phenomenal. There you go. All right, give me a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals. Well, I get up around three in the morning every morning. I work for two hours and I go to the gym for about 90 minutes. And then I have on my way back from the gym, I have a team meeting with my team at around seven in the morning. And that really sets the pace for the day. It lets me get all the mental clutter out of my head and onto my assistant's desk where she is just an unbelievable resource to sort through it. And uh, when she's sick or she's on vacation, if and, I, and we don't have that, that I'm up, I'm working, I'm going to the gym, I'm meeting with her, it really is like taking one of the legs off a three leg stool. Like it just feels so unstable. Um, so those three things I found to be really, really helpful in, in balancing out my day to day. What's your number one insight for growth marketing? You need to focus first on your offer and then the sequence of your marketing. And right. I know that is a very big thing. Uh, there's plenty of people who write about offers. Uh, dot com secrets, ex expert secrets goes into that. Alex Ramosi is an offer genius. Um, but that's uh, Joel Irway also has an amazing coaching program around offers. Uh, but that's where I would focus first. Don't don't spend a dime on ads until you go through and really master offer creation. And then once you do that, come to me and I'll show you the sequence of how you're not going to waste money on marketing. All right, let's lighten the mood here, man. You had a, a great conversation. Uh, I know you're in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Give me your favorite place to grab a bite to eat. All right, so it's called the Jigger Shop. It's old as, I mean, it's like goes back to, I think, the 1800s. It is in the middle of Mount Gretna, Pennsylvania, which is this like artsy community. It used to be like a vacation town. Like people from New York would go there. In the summer, they're only open during the summer from Memorial Day to Labor Day. So you have to go in the summer. They have un the most unbelievable ice cream you'll ever have in your life. And their food is great. You can get a good Philly cheesesteak. You can get, uh, you know, uh, they have different like pineapple carnitas tacos. It's just, it's all kind of casual fare, but you eat outside under a canopy of pine trees. And it's just like, every time we go there, I am unbelievably happy to be there. Uh, and it's not because they have fancy tables or anything like that. It's just, it's just, it's the perfect kind of summer getaway. I love it, man. We'll have to put that one on the list next time we're out that way. Uh, Drew, you gave us a lot of great insights, man. I love hearing your story going from film school to, you know, working kind of in corporate, helping people be more efficient with kind of their content creation moving over and focusing with small business owners and really helping us understand like some of the things that are holding us back, you know, how to overcome some of your fears, whether you're a natural or you're not a natural, how to create a system so that you can create content, do it with a plan in mind. So you're not just, you know, wailing around aimlessly, but really understanding that you just have to start. You have to be consistent. You have to have a plan and don't pay too much attention to the actual results right away. Just keep putting in the work and the results will come as long as you've got a good plan and you're revising that. Uh, and then also you started talking to us about just how to create content, what to look for, where to get inspiration and how to, you know, again, plan for that content. So a lot of that is very, very helpful. Again, if you want to learn more about Grow House and see if they can help you with some of the things you're hoping to accomplish, you can check them out at growhouse.org. That's G-R-O-H-A-U-S.org. Drew, I want to thank you again for coming on Multifamily Insights. We look forward to staying in touch with you, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, John. Pleasure being here. I'm looking forward to our next conversation.